Okay, Boris, I think yeah, we have everybody here. I'm just going to introduce you for the benefit of those who don't know who you are. Um, so Boris uh, joined Codeng in the early years, back at the beginning, I'd say 2015, or it may have been 2016. Which was it? Can you remember? When did you start doing the Silicon Valley trip? Uh, first Silicon Valley trip was in 2017. Um, okay. First Codeng lesson was October 2015. So somewhere in between, was it 2016 probably? Yeah. And uh, so Boris uh, joined us on our Expo Dubai trip uh, in um, last year. And um, he has also signed up for Silicon Valley departing on the 25th of July and also for the space camp. And we were just joking, I don't know if you were watching our video last week, that uh, we would give you a gold card membership of Codeng for signing up for all of our activities. So that's wonderful. We really appreciate you doing that. And um, we're delighted to have you here this evening. I'll hand over to you if you want to explain to us what you're doing, where you're doing it, and obviously specifically what you're doing in the area of um, programming computer science. I study mathematics at the uh, Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam, Free University of Amsterdam, uh, often abbreviated as VU, not to be confused with UVA, which is the main University of Amsterdam. Uh, I'm doing a bachelor's in mathematics, and I'm going to specialize in uh, pure mathematics, uh, analysis, and modeling of dynamical systems. Uh, so in our uh, first year course, we do a little bit of everything because in the second year and the third year is when you're going to specialize, when you're going to choose what to do. And so in the first year, they want us to have uh, a foundation on everything. So um, we, do a, we, we do some analysis, we do some, um, we do mostly pure mathematics, and then we do also mathematical modeling, which goes a little bit more into the applied side. And we did a short one month, you know, three credit course, so small course on Python. And I, I think the course was maybe even easier than what we did at coding because it doesn't it doesn't assume prior knowledge. So it was like an introduction for everyone, but it ramped up pretty quickly. I think. Be very interested to see what you've been working on in, in that area. Did you want to share your screen? You were mentioning earlier that you. Uh, like yes, I, I can show you a few examples. I can yeah, I can show cool. some of the. Uh, Which editor are you using? Okay, PyCharm. Yeah. Well, no, I'm not going to use uh, PyCharm. What are you using? They they made us download it. I'll keep using Sublime. Okay. Uh, they made it downloaded, but I never actually used it. Why don't you use it? You just, is your preference is sublime. I, I didn't like it. It, it was slow and I, I couldn't really uh, get to know it. Okay. So this is just an example of Python code. So the people who set up our program uh, were not uh, in the mathematics department, but they were told that we're, you know, we're studying mathematics. So think of, so they were, they were made to make, um, uh, sort of mathematical problems for us and we we had them like homework so every week we had to submit uh, submit a few of these um we actually had them um, quite a lot i think but uh, this is just like one of the many things that we submitted uh for this one we just had to make a code for the uh isaac newton's method of approximating a solution to a polynomial and this is a short way of saying 2x squared minus 3x uh, plus 1. And this tells you how many times you uh, repeated. And this gives you the initial input. So I think this one is a little bit boring in what it does. I'll just open it in idle. Um, and you'll see it just gives you the result. And it gives you the exact solution of the polynomial. But we can try a different input. I'm not going to stay on this one too long. <laughs> so the uh, starting point was what, Boris? Did they, you have to write this from scratch yourself? Yeah, they had a bunch of these inputs. And they, they, they would, first of all, they would look at the code. They would look at how it's written. They were very, very strict at grading it. So 
And, you know, they didn't like the amount of spacing. If it was a little too much, a little too little, they took off points uh, based on the names of your variables, if they were understandable, if they were not understandable, you know. Um, and they would try, they would have like five of these inputs. They will try all of them and they'll see if it gives the right result. Excellent. Okay, I don't see any comments. You are not required to comment. You're good. Okay. okay. And it just gives you, I, I told you this one's going to be boring. It just gives you like one of the solutions of this polynomial. And we can change the input. Um, uh, give, give me something. Give me any number. Okay, uh, 22. 22. Here, I can change this one. Yeah, give me some number. 99. 99. Uh, 104. Okay, we're still going to repeat it 15 times, starting from 3 as the initial value. I'll save this input and I'll see if it gives the correct answer now. Uh, Okay, so here's an answer. <laughs> uh, we can try checking it. So, so just um, to repeat for our junior coders, what is this program exactly doing? So we have a polynomial. Uh, so here on the input, so 22 times x squared plus 99x um, x plus 104. Okay, and it give and one of the solutions is minus one point six seven one, and I think this is exactly what it gave us. Basically, Newton's method: it you you put in a random guess, and it finds it differentiates the polynomial. It takes the ratio of the polynomial to its um, uh, derivative, and then it it, it 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 defines a function as that, and then it repeatedly places the function. So in the input, we have 15 here. This is the amount of time that it uses it. So it's always an approximation. Well, I mean, for most simple polynomials, it's going to give you the exact solution. But for more complicated ones like this, it's an approximation. In fact, it's a more detailed one that, than this calculator gives you. This calculator uses three decimal places. Here, Python gave me one, which is, uh, let me run it again. Um, you know, it gives me like 15 decimal places. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to stop you there and just see if there are any questions. Does anybody have any questions for Boris at this point based on this first demonstration of what he's been working on using Python with mathematics? I I kind of get what he's doing so I I don't get the formula entirely, but I kind of understand what the code is doing. So uh, is it the same for you in the Netherlands as it is for Mathia at Bocconi that the first year the computer science course is attended by people who are not necessarily doing computer science or doing mathematics, that they are required to do a course in Python? Do you have the same in the Netherlands? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, actually. Uh, okay. I know the, the business students have to do... Uh, uh, probability with us, which is why some most of our subjects, the only the math students do have like three groups with them or two groups. Mm -hmm. And for probability, we have seven groups, so the class is huge. Uh, How many students when you say huge? Um, in total, so I mean, we have seven groups, so I don't know. So maybe there's like a, a hundred students that are attending probability, maybe okay. even more than a hundred. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, gotcha. this next thing is simultaneously simpler but also a lot lot harder because mm -hmm. it's an unsolved problem in mathematics but stating it is very very simple i think uh everybody will have no problem understanding it so it relates to the callouts conjecture i wonder if anyone's heard of the callouts conjecture nobody no probably unlikely <laughs> okay start with a positive number any number, if it's even, divided by 2. If it's odd, multiply by 3 and add 1. So, for example, if you start by 5, 
five is odd, so multiply by three and add one, you get 16. And it's even, divide by two, that's eight. Divide by two again, that's four. Divide by two again, that's two. Divide by two again, that's one. One is odd, so you go back to four. And you're in this loop of four to one, four to one. And the Collatz conjecture says that every positive whole number, uh, if you do this process again and again and again, eventually goes down to this loop. And it's an unsolved problem in mathematics. Nobody has been able to solve it for. And it's, it's maybe impossible. Um, I think there's some prize money. If you solve it, it's not very much. It's not one of the uh, Manium prize problems, which you can win a million dollars in mathematics if you solve them. Although I do think it should be probably one of them. Uh, it's, de it's definitely as hard as one of those. So it's one of the biggest unsolved problems in mathematics. It's not really useful for anything, but it's just it's just this exercise of this. It's this simple little problem that you can state to a grade schooler, and nobody has been able to solve it. So this <laughs> is a program. This is a very very short program. Bar yes, Bar we have a question there from from Santiago. Go ahead, Santiago. Yeah. What What do you mean by unsolved problem? That like, do you have to find like the reason why this is or? Uh, nobody has proven that every single number goes to the 4 to 1 loop. That oh. every single number eventually 4 or to 1, those are equivalent. So it could be that there is some really big number. Every number until uh, 2 to the power of 60 has been checked. And you just need to go show that, you know, any number above that falls under those. But there is no way to check all numbers because they never end. So you have to do a proof. So if it's false, if the conjecture is false, that means one of two things. Either there's a, a number somewhere out there that is odd and it goes up. Then, you know, if you multiply by three and add one, you always get an even number. You go down, but it goes up again and down and up and down. And the general trend is upwards and then grows to infinity without bound. Or there's another way in which it could fail. There could be a different loop. Instead of the four to one loop, there could be a different closed loop. I think there's a very, very nice video. I I would recommend you to watch, but I'll, I'll send it afterward. Or you can put it in the chat. Boris, can, and backtracking a little bit, can you explain to the team if why you... Interested. Can you explain to the team, Boris, why you chose to study pure maths? What's your objective career-wise? What's your motivation for taking this course? Uh, well, I want to do research in mathematics. You want to teach? teach? Awesome. Yes. Excellent. So you're going to share with us a simpler example. Yes. Okay. So this is the code. This is all of it. It's like 10 lines. It doesn't even have to be 10 lines. Uh, you enter your integer and while n is not equal to 1, it prints it as a string because you need to print a string. Uh, so if it's divisible by 2, you divide it by two and you print that and then you go to the next line uh, and if it's odd so else there's only one other thing that can be other than even could be odd and if it's odd you multiply by three and add one and uh, this is while n is not equal to one so whenever this is not true it just prints one so i will open it now and um Okay, somebody give me a number. 728. This is the one that grows. So you never know. Here's the thing. It looks like randomness because you could you could enter a really big number. That, this is one of those that go on for a very long time. So as you can see, Python's very quick. It goes up for a while. Uh, you know, it reaches values like 7,000. And eventually, of course, it goes down to... Four to one, just like every single number people have tried up until very, very large numbers. And can I ask you yes? Can I ask you why you're running these in idle? Uh, because that's what I have. So why don't you run it in Sublime? Uh, how do you run it in Sublime? I I've only you. ever I've only ever used Sublime just to write the code, and then I run it in idle. Okay, I'm sure you can run it. In fact, I know you can run it in Sublime. It's just unusual that you're switching from uh, one text editor to another. 
but okay if that works for you yeah no problem we can try that in a minute also so here i'll show you um really the the randomness here so if you add if you put in something like 26 you see how very quickly uh it goes down to uh one now, i'm not sure if it does it again or i have to restart the problem we can do it for 28 nope that works sorry there you go 28 goes down pretty quickly so it's even divided by 2 14 even divided by 2 7 odd multiply by 3 and add 1 that's 22. So it goes on for 118 lines uh, until it goes down to one. And some of the values you see here, 9,232. So it really, it goes up and down and up and down and up and down for a long time. And the general trajectory seems to be upward, but that is only a temporary pattern. And the trajectory of every number that's ever been tried is downwards. This is contrary to what you would expect because you know, half of all integers are even, the other half are odd. And the even ones are divided by two, while the odd ones are more than tripled. So you would expect on average that the sequence would grow. But, you know, every time you multiply by three and add one for an odd number, you get an even number. So you're going to divide by two. So more, it's more like for really large numbers, you're multiplying by three halves. But it still seems like it should go to infinity for most numbers. But in, in fact, it always trends downwards. Well, it seems like it always uh, trends downwards. If the conjecture is false, then there's a number which does not go down to one. Uh, and it's definitely provable. If it's false, it's definitely provable. It means you can just name that number. Although it might not be feasible, that might, number is probably very, very, very large uh, and has different properties than what we would expect numbers to have. I think most people agree that the conjecture seems like it should obviously be true but uh you never know uh mathematicians are very very strict you know they require uh complete proofs and nobody's been able to do a complete proof for it and if you do please send it to me and mm -hmm. i will take credit santiago go ahead yes. uh i asked him like like about the same question that i had like asked matt back then yeah so uh what was the applications process like for like applying to the university you're going to and like there were some were there some like prerequisites to enter uh well the prerequisite is you gotta send them your diploma from high school but uh, you do that after you've applied so that's like the final step so it's different for each country and it's also different typically for universities so I applied in four places. I applied here where I'm now in Amsterdam, but I also applied for Leeds in England and Edinburgh and Scotland and also Sofia in Bulgaria. So uh, for the University of Sofia, I was rejected for a really terrible technical reason uh, because I, you know, in Italy we finished uh, in July and so I could only send, we got our diploma in July, we graduated in July, and so I could only send them on like the 6th or 7th of July, whenever it was, I forget. Uh, but they had closed a few days earlier, so did they, you know, they closed like at the end of June or at the beginning of July. And we asked them, could you not make an exception, please? And they said, no, it's a, it's a machine that reads it. Uh, we can't do anything about it. Sorry, you can't oh enter. I'm and that's this Bulgarian for for everybody's information on the call. Paris is Bulgarian, so that that's absolutely that's very disappointing. I I can sympathize, Boris. Yeah, I did my I did the Erasmus program. I did my final year at the University yes. of Grenoble, and I was not able to graduate with my my class back in the University of Limerick in Ireland because um, the diploma did not come out from. University of Grenoble on time to allow me to graduate with the rest of my class. So <laughs> I can sympathize with you. In the end, though, you end up with the University of Amsterdam. Are you happy with that? Yes, I am very happy to be here. Can you give us any tips, Bars, um, for our team here learning to code at this stage? Um, any kinds of um, advice you'd like to give this group? uh well yes but i think they'll be quite now so um you know it's all about time management it's all about you know putting notes somewhere for yourself because i'm very very forgetful so i have to 
you know, I put notes on my phone. I put physical notes. You know, I, I, I write things everywhere because, you know, I go to bed and I, I think, you know, the next morning I'll get, I'll, get, I'll get all this work done. And then typically it doesn't end up happening. So I got to keep notes around telling me to do stuff. Uh, I got to think about, you know, what I'm going to do this hour, what I'm going to do next hour, not delay things because uh, naturally I want to delay things as much as possible, but uh, that wouldn't be very productive if I actually did. Mm -hmm. So I, I think if, if anyone can relate to that, uh, I would say, you know, uh, I can relate a lot to that actually. <laughs> yes, that, that's something that's to think about. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. So um, in terms of what you did at coding, was there any particular area that uh, was most helpful? Well, we did. So first I learned uh, to do JavaScript together with HTML and CSS with you. And then we also did Python. And so at, at the beginning, it was just a one month course. So just throughout January, and it was an online course. Um, and I was, I was ahead of um, most other people. I think, uh, you know, in the math class, uh, like half of us had done a little bit of Python. Maybe some had done a little bit of C, which I've never done. Uh, some people had done uh, Java, and I think I'm gonna have I've, I'm gonna have an introduction to Java next year. It's gonna be one of the things that I can take. I pro probably am gonna take it. Uh, so I'm excited to learn that. I don't know how different it is from JavaScript. It's got a similar name, but I have a feeling it's going to be quite different. Do very different yeah. programming languages, yeah. Yeah, uh, and so that gave me a, a head start uh, compared to everyone else because even the people who were familiar with it, they hadn't done like a you know uh, full on you know weekly course. That we so what did they take detract uh, points for? For you said it was spacing. What else did they look at? Variable names. Uh, yeah, exactly. So if they couldn't, I mean, they, they knew what I was doing because they're, they're expecting a certain assignment, but they're they're reading it as if there's someone, you know, that I sh I randomly showed this code on the street you know, to someone uh, with no context. So it needs to be readable to as many people as possible. It needs to be uh, layman understandable. Yeah. And so, so they look, that's why they look at the variable names. Uh, it needs to be clear what the operation is. They looked at the structure. They looked at uh, if I imported anything, I uh, automatically uh, fail. I really do. Um, they, they want me to have this little thing at the beginning. This, this is like the only. I don't understand. I have. If you imported what? What do you mean? Libraries? I don't get it. Yeah, importing libraries automatically fails you. Why? Uh, I guess they consider it cheating. Uh, they want me to build everything from scratch. Wow. Interesting. They, they were very, very strict on the marking. So since this is uh, uh, one of those subjects in the year that don't have an exam, uh, everything is just homework. Like homework is 100% of it. The lectures you don't have to go to. Nobody's taking attendance, plus it's online. Um, but so it's all comes down from the homework. So people did not cheat. I, I can tell you that looking through the WhatsApp group, uh, nobody, nobody asked for answers to the homeworks. People either did them or they didn't do them. Wow. It sounds like it's really, really tough. You were coming to the end of our year and, um, yeah, it's kind of an opportunity for us to share with, to share with you, but also to kind of recap what we're working on. Is there a game of snake? Did we do this one with you? Uh, no, actually. I have done a snake game before on my own uh, volition, but I, we never did that. I think I remember you did it, but you didn't do it with Python. What did you do it with? You did it with JavaScript. Uh, JavaScript. I remember you did that. You did it in the browser. Excellent. Okay. So we worked on a few different um, concepts when we were doing that. And uh, let's see. Uh, Sasha, what were some of the new things we learned when we were building our game of Snake? Uh, using uh, classes effectively and Vector2 and, yeah. Uh, Vector2 is an easier way to, like, uh, have 2D data uh, with an X uh, and Y coordinates. Uh, so, for example, you can have... Uh, vector 2's 
and you can add them together and subtract them uh, to be able to uh, change uh, positions of uh, like sprites on uh, in code. Yeah. yeah, exactly. If we didn't use vector two, what would we be forced to use? What would be the alternative? Lots of lists. <laughs> Lots of lists and indexing and so on. Exactly. Okay. Thanks for that, Sasha. Um, Max, um, what did you learn when we were doing when we were working on this? We, um, for example, there uh, Sasha talked about um, the use of class and object-oriented programming. Can you talk to me a little bit about the terminology that we're using for um, for creating our various classes? It's like object-oriented programming is like um, you use methods, attributes, and classes. And um, uh, also the code is like all in one spot and it looks a lot cleaner. And um, you can also reuse it better than if you just use functions. And you can also describe the object with the attributes. Okay. So uh, using your own words there, how would you describe then um, method versus attribute? Methods are the thing they're doing. And then, like for example, I am running. And then the attributes are like I'm running at one kilometer an hour or something. Good, OK. So the methods are basically the functions within the class. And then the attributes are, yeah, like the characteristics. Very good. Okay, um, Susan, so when we're actually running our game of snake, is the snake actually moving or are we, what are we actually doing to give this impression that the snake is moving? Um, it's not actually moving, we're just uh, putting the last block, so the tail of the snake um, on, on the head of the snake, so on the beginning to make it look like it's moving. So we just move the blocks. OK. And what are we doing to understand where all the blocks are in the snake? Uh, we're using a numerate, which uh, just like cycle through the, the whole body of the snakes. And just like it sees um, like where the snake is um, and like for example, for the head, um, we just like thanks to enumerate, we we see which head we need to use. So there's up, down, left, and right, and we use enumerate to know which one we're using. Exactly. If you want to fire up Kahoot, and let's um, let's take our quiz. So for our last lesson next week, we will be meeting here uh, from six, six o'clock onwards, and we will be giving out certificates and we will be doing a general update on tech news. Um, so everybody's welcome to attend for that. That is, of course, an in-person event. So hopefully you guys will all show up. So far, I think we've got, um, yeah, we've got about 15 people, 14 people, so that's great. The more, the merrier. Okay, let's run through this. When's the last time you did a Kahoot quiz, Forrest? <laughs> uh, in the intro week. For oh, the you did that at, uh, at uni. Excellent.